Thank, thank you very much. And uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. And, and uh, I'm going to pick up where, where Milo left off, which is uh, you know, looking at, I think, giving a very compelling picture of uh, bandwidth writ large and networking at the, uh, the large scale penetrating down to you know, the, the devices. I'm going to take that a, a step further and, and uh, for the next 45 minutes just on this journey of what is optical uh, networking or optical interconnect mean inside machines. So actually, how do you go build computers and, and what are the implications of that? Um, and, and for me, it's a very interesting question because this is more than just, you know, are we going to inside data centers and then inside backplanes and all the way down to the module level? Are we doing something that's, you know, um, kind of this predictable, we're going to replace copper, we're, we're going to have a different uh, kind of fabric in these systems. Um, that's one way to look at it. Um, I actually see it as an opportunity and more of a catalyst that will uh, allow us to sort of rethink the way that we actually build machines. And so that's sort of the, that's, that's the gist of this talk. If you're going to get, I hope, two things that, get, that come away from it. If you're interested, in seeing the you know, optical technology really penetrate into data centers and down into machines themselves. Um, I'll try to give you some insight into what's important there and what's different from um, the way we think of it in, in wider scales. Uh, and then I'll also sort of give what I think is going to be um, some fairly profound changes in machines. But I do have, um, well, something like a, an admission, maybe a confession here. Uh, back around when, when um, uh, actually Milo was starting Excite at Home, I, I, had a, I gave a talk, I was invited to a, uh, uh, give a, a keynote talk at um, an optical computing conference that was held at Stanford. And uh, so this was late 90s, and I uh, you know, was asked to, to talk about what I thought was going to be the future of optical computing you know, optical components inside computers. And at that time, I said, well, um, well, let me see. OK, they're uh, more expensive. Uh, they consume more power. And they're unreliable. Um, and <laughs> it was a very short keynote. And <laughs> needless to say, I wasn't invited back to that conference. <laughs> but let's, let's, uh, let's start here. Obviously, th things have changed. Um, and let's, let's sort of start at a, at a really high level, sort of uh, dovetailing with the last presentation. Um, you know, if you're an historian and you're looking back uh, 100 years and you're trying to write the, the history of this time, you know, what, what are we going to call the era that we're in? Uh, and some people, you know, it's, is it the computing revolution? What's the, the revolution? Um, I think it's, we'll call it the networking revolution and uh, the network age. And in this, you know, at a very sort of high level in this uh, maybe, maybe sort of glossy view, but what has been happening over the past um, couple of decades has really been this, uh, you know, the exponential, predictable exponential decline in the cost of connecting things to networks. You know, really going from, um, you know, $100 for a network interface card and sort of the, the connections in the early 90s now to if you, you know, get a, a system on chip, um, it's hard to get one that doesn't have uh, a network capability, just literally pennies. And I think part of the consequence of that, and of course the growth in the, the, the actual uh, access networks um, and backbones, um, have, you know, yes, it looks glossy, but there's actually a, you know, a, a not constant coefficient on the exponential on the number of things that we're hooking up to networks. And it's taking us through these, uh, you know, these eras of having connected computers. And I think we're sort of in the middle of this, you know, well, it's all about people and social networks and the, you know, us being connected to networks. And, you know, I think the, the next phase that we're all anticipating is, you know, the Internet of Things and everything connected to, to networks. And so the, you know, the, um, um, the, the consequence of that combines with this, which is 
uh, you know, what's the growth in bandwidth? And, and you know, Milo uh, talked a lot about this in both the, the wire and, and, and wireless uh, area. I just like to remind ourselves that, you know, sort of back in, in the, uh, you know, the beginning of the web, sort of uh, 93, 94, I mean, I felt really good when I could get 9,600 baud. And when I went to 56K, I had like died and gone to heaven. And actually, uh, one of my uh, startups uh, I, I help with, PictureTel, was actually founded on um, sort of the availability of switched 56 kilobit uh, you know, AccuNet. Um, and, um, and so, so what happens here? Well, um, you combine the last two slides and you get this thing that is sort of like Kirchhoff's law here, right? Um, it's a very simple sort of uh, view, but you, know, you look at the number of devices on the, on the right-hand side, you look at their bandwidth demands, um, you multiply that out, and um, actually because, um, you know, if you discount for peer-to-peer, -peer, which is not a big, um, component of, of, of the network, um, at least not, not in this phase of networking, uh, then the goes in has got to equal the goes out us, right? The, that, that bandwidth has to be fed from something. And so there's sort of the other side, right? If you're supplying that bandwidth, so if you're Google or you're Reed Hastings at, at Netflix or uh, Baidu, um, you have to think about how you're going to supply it. And that's what this talk is about, right? How do you build the stuff on the left-hand side to supply the stuff on the right, going through all that marvelous um, technology in the middle? So um, one thing that it's kind of quiet. Actually, it's a, it's a bit of a, um, uh, if, if you're a computer or architect like myself, it's really profound. Um, but from a business point of view and from a kind of social awareness, we really haven't seen the fact that there's been an enormous consolidation in um, computing in the server side. Uh, basically, there are a few companies, and I've, I've given you some of the icons on the, the ones uh, on the right-hand side, but, but the Googles of the world who, uh, Google, I think in particular, runs the biggest computer in the world. And, and by biggest computer, I mean not you know, the individual elements, but their networked collection, the idea that um, I will you know, uh, think about managing them and connecting them and, and actually uh, harnessing them to, to run problems collectively. Uh, you know, if you're a, a startup now and doing anything that has to do with um, building out a, uh, a service that goes, uh, uh, you know, a cloud service or consumer service, if you're doing anything but going to a service provider like Amazon or Rackspace, um, you had better be doing something really special or you're really stupid. I mean, to put it, put it bluntly. Um, and so, um, and actually just to embellish this, uh, it's not quite the picture, you know, there was, a, uh, Milo had a, a great mention of, of content distribution networks. Um, they're actually a big piece of this as well. They're an even sort of quieter, more, you know, less visible part of this whole equation. And um, I actually don't think this is stable over time. I think what happens is that if you're building really big computers and you get really big scale, you build your own content distribution networks over time. But that's, that's maybe a, a personal question. So, so now to sort of the, um, you know, the, the meat of, of this, which is, you know, what, what is actually happening in the design of those systems? And, and, and Gordon Bell um, made this, this observation, which I call Bell's Law, and, and Gordon has not objected to me calling it that, um, so that's good. Uh, but about every, every 10 or 15 years or so, you know, Gordon had observed that there was a change in sort of organizing principles behind the systems. When I, I looked at that, so you went from mainframe to mini computer to PCs to uh, uh, you know, sort of symmetric multiprocessors, uh, server designs, and you know, roughly sort of at this decadal um, cadence. Um, when I look at it, I really uh, uh, think about technologies underneath which enabled some of these transitions. You know, really transistor and core memory enabling uh, the mainframe to small and medium scale integration uh, to mini computer era and, you know, finally microprocessor, et cetera. And then, 
you know, the SMP is really VLSI and, and, and DRAM. And, and the, at that era, sort of in the 90s, we got to sort of explore, you know, how do you build um, systems with, with sort of order 100 processors. And then this whole, you know, Kirchhoff's Law web thing happened, and we had to really scramble to go figure out how you provide the left-hand side. And some companies did and have done this, uh, you know, famously up in scales of, of um, uh, tens of thousands of, of systems working co uh, collectively. And, and sort of the, you know, the enabling technology on that was, you know, system on chip, and um, if you will, I, I view a multi-core processor that, uh, and, and fast, uh, fast IP. And so I think this, this next scale, you know, how do you start to think about uh, systems that have a million elements in them and call that a computer? I think that's sort of the continuing progression of, of silicon integration, which is what's after system on chip, well, it's network on chip, and you're, you're starting to see a lot of that. Um, and, and optics, right? So that's, that's sort of the, you know, the, this enabling technology, I believe optics will have a role in sort of defining computing architecture the way these other, the way transistors and, and core memory did in, in defining um, things in the past. So. Uh, how do you do it, right? <laughs> so at the end, you know, at the end of, the, of, of my talk, you're all gonna be uh, able to go out and, and build your own machines. That's, that's the goal. Um, now, as I said, there are, some, there are a couple of things that you really have to think a bit differently about as you shift from, um, you know, uh, how do I build really large networks um, and at, at sort of wide scale, where a lot of that is bandwidth. And a lot of the conversation is, how much does it cost me to deliver a gigabit per second? And, you know, um, and there's actually, when you crawl inside machines, um, um, the, the, the world changes a bit. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to, to sort of get you thinking about is, um, you know, what's the difference between this? I pile up 10,000 servers, right, versus I build a big computer from those 10,000 servers. And then those, those systems are actually sitting inside there. Well, well it's, it's the network, stupid, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> sorry. It's, it's the connectivity of these systems that actually get you to, to talk about them as, as a computer. And that's both their physical connectivity, but it's also their software connectivity. And you know, how do I think of things, um, not only the software management of the network, but the, the applications themselves. And this is mostly, if, if you say, left as an exercise to the user today, is that you get these servers, uh, get networking kit, get um, storage, which looks an awful lot like servers now, and, um, and then you build data centers. Right? So, so actually, you build those big computers. Uh, that, that are, are sitting on the right. That's, that's sort of a schematic of, of the plumbing of a data center. I kind of like it because it looks like a circuit board of some sort and you know, it, it's evocative to me of that. That's what we're building, right, these big systems. And so as I said, there's, there are things that change and changing from um, bandwidth think, um, the, um, uh, there's, there's some really uh, great uh, work that's influenced me in this area over time. Uh, you know, the, uh, this is Arvind and Iannucci, and, and I think first articulated it, but you really have to think, and the big message you should get, uh, is fundamentally think about latency, not bandwidth, right? And it's delay. And what I'm gonna do is gonna take the next five or six slides or so and really drive that home. All right. What do I mean by latency? Because it's a it's a uh, really important concept. It is a it is a defining performance concept in machines, and really bandwidth is secondary to latency. So so let's let's talk about that. Um, so what do I mean by that? I you know just slow down. Make sure you kind of ingest this idea, um, and uh, maybe it's all natural to you. But but you think about uh, program executing. So I'm a microprocessor, I'm happily uh, executing away of my code, and I want to read this element in an array, okay? And um, uh, that element, uh, if I'm lucky, is in my cache. If it's not, I have to go out and, and fetch it, okay? And it is, it is, in fact, the time between when I read it and I got the value back, um, that's the latency, right? Because 
um, if I have a dependence on that data, if I, I, need, I read it because I needed it, right? Um, I, I don't have anything to do until I get that data back unless I have some other form of parallel work that I've identified. Okay, so a lot of microprocessor design is sitting there trying to figure out how I can stuff, you know, instructions into that gap where I can execute things that are not dependent on me getting that read back yet. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the, the critical idea here. And the only way that you can sort of overcome latency or the cost of latency is to invest parallelism, is to do something else in that, in that time. But that's an exponentially harder challenge as technology moves on. So I just want you to imagine this. You know, I have two sort of contemporary processors separated, uh, you know, across 50 feet. Um, and, and um, you know, say there are eight cores at three gigahertz. Uh, they can issue four instructions, et cetera, et cetera. So what you see is actually these processors have a raw capacity of issuing about 100 instructions every nanosecond. Right? So um, if you look at it just from the processor point of view, um, you know, if, if it wants to communicate to another processor that's separated across, it sends a message off. It's like sticking it in a bottle, right? Because by the time that even the fastest turnaround can come back is that you've executed almost 10,000 instructions in the meantime. You'd better find other things to do um, while that communication is taking place. So how does bandwidth fit into this, all right? And I'm going to give you a really sort of almost a pejorative view of bandwidth. Is it, I just view bandwidth as just another component to latency, all right? And how do you think about it that way? Okay, so um, say that I've got this channel, okay, pipe. It's connecting two pieces of my computer, uh, and I'm sending a message across that channel. And so I start at time equals zero, and I stuff that message in through the channel, and I'm going to wait for it to come out the other side. Right? And what are, what's the total time it takes me to get that message delivered? What does that look like? You didn't think you were going to come in the morning and have to think this hard, huh? Okay. Um, so the total delivery time is the time of flight, right? It's the, you know, the speed of light through that medium if we're doing uh, optics here, but it's that, that propagation delay. And then it's the serialization delay, which you see is how long does it take that whole message to get through? Because I'm making an assumption here that um, I actually can't start using the message on the right-hand side until I've seen the whole thing, all right? Which for a short message is probably a pretty good assumption. Long message, you can do other things. But you also want to think about it, by the way, in here, that I have to wait for the tail of the message to come in. This is also a mistake that people have historically made in things like how am I going to do error correction or detection in the message? You know, I might actually, you know, have to see the whole message before I can detect whether the checksum on the message is correct or the, you know, the error code or whatever it is. And so um, all of that goes into this. So you get these sort of extraordinary tension in the design of these machines where, uh, and now I want you to think, I'm thinking of data center scale, but also now this goes, uh, has the effect all the way down to the design of the individual element itself, which is that at one level I want things close together because that reduces latency. Um, it also gives, reduces material and it reduces my footprint. So it's, you know, having things close together is a big deal. Um, and uh, uh, yet, as you can imagine, having things uh, pulled apart is also kind of important, like if you want to get inside and never change anything uh, or service it, uh, certainly your stress on packaging changes here, uh, and then there's the, the issue of, of actually, you know, uh, we, computing is actually really inefficient, um, and, you know, mostly what we built are really big space heaters, and, uh, you know, how do you get the, the heat out and keep, keep things happy? So, so you get these um, sort of two tensions. I think that the, the things that become really interesting to me about optics coming down at the scale, and I'm going to sort of transition to this, but just to, to talk about it, is that um, if I actually get lower power now, and it looks very much like you know, the, the, a very compelling reason to get to, to optical interfaces at these designs, unlike when I 
was talking to the, you know, a, a, a dozen years or so ago, is that actually sort of from a picojoules per bit, um, uh, it's, it, it is uh, certainly going to be better than uh, using electrical interfaces uh, to transmit those bits. And by the way, at that level, that's really, you know, what you have to think about is, you know, what is the cost, energy cost of communicating a bit across any interface in the system. And that interface may be a pin on a package, right, or uh, between uh, a couple of packages that are, are sped. So, but, but here's my problem, <laughs> right? I, you know, light speed is actually slow. Right. I, you know, from a, from a computing point of view, and if you're taking this latency point of view, light is slow. And I, I, um, I must say that I'm, uh, do people know who that is on the right hand side? It's uh, uh, Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, who uh, among um, having, having developed COBOL, but she was a, a big exponent for, for, for computing, and she used to carry around a uh, piece of wire that was a foot long and say, this is a nanosecond. Right. That's a nanosecond. And um, I, I, uh, I keep asking my physics friends, and maybe somebody in here can help me with this, you know, that I either want, like, faster light, right? And I was really, I had this, this mixture of, of disappointment and relief to see that the CERN uh, uh, experiment was, in fact, experimental error, and we really don't have things propagating faster than light yet. Um, so far, nobody's come forward to help me with that one. Uh, the other one was, if you could give me another dimension, um, I could like tuck some communications in through that dimension and maybe do a, 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 nobody's helped me with that either. So we're stuck in three dimensions with C being very slow. Um, as long as we're, we're having a little bit of fun, okay, so uh, this just humor me a bit, right? Uh, so if I think about like out a hundred or a couple hundred years, <laughs> um, and what's the limit on this stuff? Because I want to make things really dense, and we're going to build the biggest computers in the world, and Google will celebrate its hundredth anniversary and build a giant computing, right? So you, computer, you know, you're going to get things denser and denser to minimize the speed of light problem. But in, the problem is, is that anything far away is really, really, really far. Right? Because this, you know, computer is thinking so fast, right, that even another one that's sitting in another town is really far away from that one. And then you get sort of this fundamental thing that the, its ability to compute grows like the cube, but its ability to communicate is surface area limited. What happens? AIs get bored. <laughs> uh. And that's the fundamental limit on computing. Okay. Now, back to our show. Um, so, this is really a question, in some sense, of scale penetration and taking uh, uh, optics down from where we, you know, historically look at the, the uh, uh, y-axis here on um, sort of log link scale from, you know, tens of kilometers for the, you know, the real heroic submarine uh, cables. Um, you know, all the way down into sort of the meter range where we talk about data center now, where it's very active conversation uh, in this. And sort of this progression, you, know, you see link speed increase over time. This actually uh, is, is a slide I stole from Ashok uh, Krishnamurthy, uh, a freshly minted IEEE fellow. Ashok, thank you. Um, he, he adds a whole bunch of other uh, stuff on here, like the number of links and their cost and, and uh, all kinds of things. And I encourage you to go. Uh, reference that, but but what we're really talking about is sort of this, you know, what happens at these smaller scales, and and uh, what are the the challenges in doing it. I wanted to just sort of talk about 40 gigabits per second, and it's weird in some sense in this thing where we're dealing with exponentials all the time to pick out a particular value and say this one is important. And the reason why you know, there's some constant bandwidth that feels important to me is because C is a constant, right? And guess what? At about 40 gigabits, if you followed all that stuff about time of flight and serialization delay, and if I gave you a 256-byte packet, which is a nice byte size control thing, it's a cache line size thing, it's just kind of a, you know, a nice smallish packet, and I wanted to squirt that 256-byte packet down a 10-meter 
uh, optical interconnect, then it takes me about 50 nanoseconds time of flight and it takes me about 50 nanoseconds serialization delay at 40 gigabits per second, which just sort of says that, you know, 400 gigabits per second for that message wouldn't be that much better, right? Um, that it's kind of interesting, these time of flight serialization delay for a short message is imbalance at around that. And I'll say from a, if I were, you know, giving a talk more deeply about sort of data center networks, uh, there are a lot of reasons why I actually would like to have more channels than, um, uh, that are, you know, kind of of good enough bandwidth than fewer wider uh, channels. And that has a lot to do with statistical uh, collisions and um, a, a, a bunch of things about the network. But um, let's go back to our diagram and really ask, and this is sort of the, you know, the, you know, the substance of the question this morning of um, what does it mean to go through that, that barrier? And, um, and will it happen? I think yes, that's absolutely inevitable. Uh, you know, it's, I think as we, we get into sort of 100 gigabit per second links, um, again, you talk about shorter messages and shorter distances when you get into backplanes. Talking about things like 100 gigabit per second, that's like maybe four by 25 gigabit is the way you would think about it today. That becomes important. It's the same time of flight serialization delay kind of arguments. Now you can sort of up the game a bit because uh, the scale is uh, lower. Uh, all the way down to the module level, meaning connecting chips uh, to one another. Um, I believe this is inevitable. So um, why in just a second, but uh, uh, here's a, uh, just a little model I want you to think about. Very simple view of, of, a, of a, a, a computer, a, you know, an individual server element. Um, you know, there's, there are processors, and those processors, as I say, are systems on chip. They're multi-core beasts. Uh, but I put two, maybe four, maybe more on a, on a board, but a couple is about right. Um, I have, uh, you know, local memory, usually in the form of DRAM and uh, those modules, and, uh, and then I have uh, I.O. And that I.O., you know, is just becoming more and more collapsed down onto a few protocols, and you, if you want to think of it as just IP uh, I.O., that's probably good enough right now, but um, PCI Express is, at least right now, a very important uh, uh, component in there, too. So, you know, there's that cloud on the, that server is an interconnect too, right? So I want to want to look at that stuff. All right. Well, if you're you're designing those chips, and in, and in particular those processor chips, which want to talk to both I/O and a lot of memory, um, you face this sort of fundamental problem, which is that you can imagine this, right? That each processor chip has to be able to um, have a communication interface whose bandwidth increases at least at the rate of Moore's law, right? That, that, that bandwidth has to increase uh, uh, to keep up with um, um, the processing power, the throughput of the processor. So even so, I sort of, you know, was saying, hey, think about latency. Obviously, if your bandwidth is constrained, then that becomes uh, an issue here, too. Which, so you see on the top, uh, the top exponential there is that sort of predictable, if you will, but increase in, in um, in, in total bandwidth on, on a chip, off-chip I.O. bandwidth. What you see in the, the, the uh, shallower slope exponential in the blue line on the bottom are the number of pins on a package, right? It's just kind of harder, um, you know, physics and all kinds of uh, interesting packaging technology limits to grow the number of pins in a package, all right? So what, what, how do you keep on that upper line? Well, right, you can do the ratio, and it means that each pin has to be able to uh, support higher and higher bandwidths, um, uh, gigabits per second. And we're just actually getting to limits there which are starting to become real issues as you get into sort of the, you know, 20, 25 gigabits per second for even short distances on circuit boards. Those become real engineering challenges uh, to do that uh, um, using electrons. And, uh, and, and copper interconnect. Uh, let alone, as I said before, you know, maybe kind of the best versions of these interfaces are expending 10 picojoules to move a bit, like say from that processor to your memory controller. Um, we really, if you wanna stay on this uh, treadmill, if you say like a terabit per second, 
uh, at 10 picojoules per bit is what? 10 watts, right? So you can't do that, right? You have to, you have to get that down to a picojoule per bit or, or even lower to, to stay on this curve. Um, so uh, there's, I think there's a, there's a bunch of, of, of uh, uh, just electrical engineering, um, both from, and also power density things that drive you to say, uh, uh, gee, this first level of interconnect, I really want to go uh, see uh, fiber optics come into this. And so I think the first phase of this is as you penetrate down through that data center into the back plane, um, you begin to say, well, okay, I'm going to do optical backplanes to, to connect a few of these servers together. Think of that at the rack level is the way I like to think of it. Um, and what that lets you do, and this would be a whole other talk, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of why I think this is optical uh, components in computers are acting as a catalyst to rethink computer architecture is because one of the things I really want to do at this point is to refactor the design. If, if, I, if I can get uh, bandwidth to be easily placed around sort of cheaply within this packaging, there are a lot of reasons why I want to pull the I.O. out and consolidate the processor and memory together. Right? So that's one step that you see. You see that sort of, you know, kind of cartoon style on the top that I'd like to go share I.O. in a way. And there are lots of uh, architectural benefits uh, and, and software and virtualization benefits you get from doing that. The, um, you know, this is sort of something that's happening now. I think that if, if you're a machine designer, you aren't thinking in these terms, uh, you're, you're probably, uh, um, um, you're going to lose, right? That uh, there's both this sort of ability to think about um, backplanes both from a connector system point of view, um, and, uh, and then there's the whole cost equation. And my, my friends at, at Luxterra uh, uh, helped me uh, sort of just to show at least uh, at, at a, a pretty dramatic level um, what the costs are relative of copper to optics and thinking about 100 gigabit, uh, in this case a couple of 100 gigabit, 8 by 25 gigabit uh, link. Um, which would be sort of appropriate for this, this backplane application. And really the big thing to get out of, you could look at the legends on here, but the big cost in the copper side is not actually the interface electronics, it's the uh, printed circuit board materials and the substrates and things that you need to be able to handle frequencies of that. If you look at the optical costs, uh, those are all about the components because the fibers to connect them are relatively inexpensive. And so you get these two lines uh, of, of cost curves above, uh, which are, are quite dramatically separated. Um, and the next, you know, from certainly from uh, uh, a Luxterra point of view, and, and I, uh, I think this is uh, uh, just right on, is that, you know, we see optics certainly at, at sort of the MSA and active uh, optical uh, cable level. Um, so to this, this phase that we're in now, and I think a lot of designs are happening, and this Optify is, is, is a Luxterra name, but um, you know, sort of this idea that we're going to do embedded uh, optics where we're, we don't have sort of this you know, multi-source kind of thing. It's, it's what we're designing inside a machine we get to embed it in and be a little more bespoke about what those protocols are uh, and, and design backplanes out of it. And I think the next thing <clears throat> is actually right down to the uh, system on chip itself. And that's sort of the, you know, the last part about this is that if I really now think about optical motherboards, I get to refactor the whole machine. And I get to do things like processing complexes, memory, NIO, uh, think of those as pools. In some sense, for people who are in the computing business, this is almost like you know, the reinvention of symmetric multiprocessors. I think that happens. Uh, because it's capable, we're going you know, to think about errors and a whole bunch of things a little differently. But I think it starts at the, the sort of rack level and then maybe goes up to the row and container. And, and actually, I think the, the software model for this, I will lay, lay some bets, will be something related to actually to open flow and the refactoring of, of uh, the separation of control and, and data and management planes that are happening in the networking level. I think these, these jests are going to come together because these are really sort of network components, and I, I just will have fungibility of them. 
Um, so I think really optical interconnect is this catalyst to think differently. And end of this decade, 2020, you won't recognize uh, machine designs because uh, certainly if you open up a machine today, you open one up in just less than a decade, they will look very differently in, inside because of this. And I think it will also change the dynamic of the industry because if you are, you know, well, let's just say it gets to, to remake who's important in the industry in both the supply side, uh, a whole lot of dynamics there. Um, I think it lets you challenge what I think of as commodity think. Um, you know, it's, it's what we think of commoditization of computers um, and not to be confused with sort of the commoditization of computing. In other words, if you wanted to build a big power plant, you probably wouldn't pick, you know, really the cheapest, uh, you know, portable generators and stack them up, right? You'd, you'd go and say, hey, you know, what's the physics of efficiency here? What's the first principles? How do I think about building large systems? And it's sort of that kind of thing. And you see this in all kinds of industries that as you scale up, right, as you get to these really big systems, you know, Milo was talking about sort of the, everybody knows Google's costs, you know, fetishes about things it's because you have to be brutally efficient, or you get to be brutally efficient. When you're, when you're at these scales, uh, you know, um, uh, small numbers get, get uh, cost differences in components get multiplied by very large numbers of how much you deploy. And that's also something you need to really deeply internalize if you want to be participating at this level of, of uh, you know, components or technology, is how do you drive that, that cost out? Of things. So now I just want to end with, um, you know, what I promised was was thinking about an exascale system, and so I'm doing this in the supercomputing, which is sort of the swamp that I came out of, uh, you know. So I think in terms of floating point operations per second, and you know, I started my career in machine design around the uh, early '80s, and you know, the Cray XMP. Anybody here use an XMP in their career? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, was a gigaflops. Well, it was kind of 800 megaflops, but gigaflops machine, right? Kind of 1984. Um, we were all from, as researchers, we were all sort of looking at, at teraflops or terror flops, as we would say, you know, that, that uh, DARPA and Department of Energy in the U.S. were pushing very hard and uh, we're working uh, quite uh, competitively and closely with our friends in Japan over this. And again, the first system to, to sort of grab the brass ring was, uh, uh, you saw in 1997, which is the ASCII RED system running at Los Alamos. Uh, uh, made by, by IBM, and then, um, and then a thousand-fold that, the petaflop system in 2008, it actually turned out to be an IBM design, uh, Roadrunner. Okay, so now we have to build an exaflops system, uh, 10 to the 18th. Okay, so we're gonna have these nice optically enabled, you know, optics to the chip modules. Uh, and um, I don't know who wins that. I, I put in parentheses there GCC question mark. It's obviously a machine that hasn't been built yet, but I think it's going to be the great computer of China, and uh, we'll see who builds that first. Um, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but, but here's the thing that's kind of crazy. How do you build that? How do you think about the computing power on it? And it kind of, you know, at least for me, makes me just pause. Um, that one way you want to think about it is, well, I'm going to put 100,000 of those processor, optical processor modules together. That's pretty reasonable. I think I can figure out how to do that. Each of those having the computational capacity of 10 of the world's biggest computers in 1997. That chip, 10 of those, right? And, um, and just to, to uh, really drive home that we are collectively crazy, the other way to think about it, the other easy way to do it, is just put 10,000 Cray XMPs on that chip and put 100,000 chips together and you have something that, um, that gets you to it, XMPs. <laughs> Thank you very much.